Uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, the panel. If the theme of the music didn't give it away, I will survive. <laughs> I was actually reflecting on the many lyrics in this song and how appropriate or inappropriate they could be for this panel. Uh, don't walk out the door, uh, don't turn around now. <laughs> Um, I was petrified, certainly there was a period when that was true. Uh, so this was a super That's appropriate, good. we could spend an hour, I think, analysing the theme of that song for this panel, but we won't uh, because we've got five great panellists here and we're going to have a very in-depth conversation very much about USMCA uh, and also looking forward to the review period. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panellists shortly, uh, so, but before I do that, I'd just like to give a couple of high-level kind of observations and remarks to set the scene. From where I sit, I think that there is, on the one hand, a very good story to be told about USMCA, about North American economic relationships overall. I think that there is a mixed story to tell on disputes amongst uh, our North American governments, and I think that there are clouds on the horizon. On the uh, trade and investment front, I'm sure this is all very familiar to you, trade is now approximately $3 million a minute. Uh, we've bounced back from the pre-pandemic lows. Uh, USMCA obviously is now a little over three years old and there's a lot of investment um, in the pipeline, in part obviously being driven by the uh, CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, but USMCA is providing a lot of policy certainty and a floor for you know, expanding investment and opportunity. On the disputes front, I think it's a good story in that we are now having state-to-state -state disputes, which we didn't have really under NAFTA. In a complex economic relationship like this one, you would expect disputes, and I think channeling disputes into a formal dispute settlement process is a good thing. Uh, I think that we that the, the extent that the US and the USTR in particular has leaned into the rapid response mechanism in the Labor chapter is, I think, positive, particularly politically, in that it is demonstrating that this new innovative mechanism can work and deliver results. I think it's good, whatever one may think about the outcome on investor state dispute settlement, that we are not talking about investor state dispute settlement at the moment. But it is um, mixed because we do not have a great track record of compliance with disputes. And I think this is very familiar to everyone in this room. The US lost the case on rules of origin, hasn't complied. There's an ongoing consultation with Mexico over energy. Uh, Canada has sort of been relitigating the, the dairy case a couple of times now. The, and there are disputes on the horizon which are significant. There's a corn biotech dispute and there are potentially disputes around uh, digital services taxes in Canada. Um, and this all is going to matter because of the clouds on the horizon piece, which is a combination of politics. We're all going to go through elections between now and renewal of USMCA in 2026, which is my final point. Because all this matters when one thinks about setting ourselves up for successful renewal of the agreement. So this is a new part, a new, this is, was not in NAFTA, it's, I don't know if it's actually been in a previous free trade agreement, but essentially the way this works is that there's to be a joint review of the agreement which is to take place and by the 1st of July 2026, all three governments need to unanimously agree whether or not to renew USMCA. If there is not unanimity, this process then continues for 10 years. So every year there's a joint review there's an attempt to get unanimity. If by 2036, it is still the case that there is no unanimity, USMCA terminates. So we are now a little over halfway through USMCA since USMCA came into effect and when renewal has to uh, take place. And so this panel is certainly an opportunity, I think, to look at where we're at in terms of the economic and trade relationship, how USMCA has been performing and to think about renewal and what, where we are and how do we prepare for that renewal process going forward. So that's enough for me. Let me uh, quickly uh, introduce the panellists. You've all got comprehensive bios, so I'm really going to introduce the panellists briefly and just run down the line. Uh, Louise Blaise is uh, the, as a senior special advisor to the Business Council of Canada. She served as Canada's deputy permanent representative to the United Nations in New York from 2017 to 2021. Uh, she's currently uh, also strategic advisor of the Pendleton Group 
senior special advisor um, as, at the Business Council, as I mentioned, Consigliere Strategic at the G, QG100 Network and, and other appointments and so forth. Um, Anna Lilia Cervantes is the uh, Director um, for Culture at GPP Cultiva. Uh, she holds the position there of Chief Human Resources Office, Officer. Uh, GPP is a renowned enterprise specialising in carbonated and non-carbonated beverages. She's got extensive oversight and responsibility for over 40,000 individuals at that organisation. Um, Ileana Ross Letinen um, is a former representative in the United States Congress from uh, Florida, where she served for almost three decades. Uh, she was the representative in South Florida, I should say. Uh, she was chairwoman um, of many very important distinguished committees in Congress over the years, uh, chairwoman emeritus of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, chairwoman of the Subcommittee on the Middle East and North Africa. She also served on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and was a member of the CIA Subcommittee and the National Security Agency and Cybersecurity Committee, and that's not all of them. So a very, very <laughs> distinguished career. She's now at mm -hmm. Aiken. Not Thank Aiken you, um, Francisco Gonzalez is president of the National Auto Parts Industry. He's the former CEO of Banco Nacional de Comercio Exterior, uh, Mexico's largest auto parts manufacturer. He also served as Mexico's ambassador to Germany between 2010 Ooh. and 2013. Um, John Orr is the Executive Vice President and Chief Transformation Officer at um, Canada Pacific, Kansas City. Um, as Chief Transformation Officer there, his responsibilities include Mexico's operations, network operations, planning and design, labour relations and regulatory affairs. I think that's everyone. So. We're going to have a conversation, uh, a fairly free-flowing conversation. My first question to the panel is just to give me, you know, you've, you've all got very unique perspectives on this, so just give me your sense of how we are going broadly in terms of the, the economic relationship, but also specifically how you see the state of USMCA at this point. If you want to just, we can, we can run down the line, but please feel free to come in or not as you, as you so choose. Sure. Yep. Thank you, Josh. First of all, thank you for choosing our panel. Uh, it's so wonderful to see so many of you. Um, I, um, I'm happy to answer that question. I think that USMCA, while you know we're staring at the renewal right in the face coming up in 2026, we have to remind ourselves that it's still a young agreement. It's, 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 and in the span since its inception, we've had COVID, We've had the war in Ukraine. So really <coughs> judging it's, it's how it's performing, it's, it's probably a, li a little too early to, to say. But I will say what we know for sure is that it's brought certainty for the environment. And what it has also done is psychologically speaking, and you can never underestimate that. I mean, I work with businesses all the time and some of the decisions they make I'm so, are emotional decisions. They're, they're just, there's, there's a feeling about North America that is positive based on that agreement. The fact that the three parties were able to, to, uh, to come to an agreement under difficult circumstances, you could argue. Um, and, and, and so it, I think in a way it is really forging um, a path for the region to attract foreign direct investment and to continue to increase the flow of goods that was already very well established under NAFTA. I'll, uh, I'll end there. I'll know we'll, I want to let my fellow panelists uh, add their word and I'll come in later okay, for the rest. Yeah. Anyone else want to come in on how they are seeing USMCA at this well, point? I think uh, um, President Trump touts this correctly as uh, as one of his greatest achievements in his, in his years in office. And I think only a Donald Trump could have gotten uh, a recalcitrant Republican Party to vote for it because they were, uh, we had moved, or my party has moved so much from uh, a pro-trade, very pro-trade, to now being so isolationist in, uh, uh, in the way we look at the war in Ukraine and the way we, we look at trade measures. But it was Trump's popularity with his Republican base that really made it so successful. Uh, there were only um, 40, 41 votes against it in the U.S. House of Representatives, and in the Senate, only 10 votes against it. And you look at the dysfunctional uh, Congress today, um, 
they can't pass anything. We have a budget that has to be renewed. And I worry about the fate of the USMCA as we reach that 2026 critical date because I don't know which party will be controlling the House or the Senate uh, or the White House, but the state of the Republicans now would, would be to not look upon this trade deal favorably unless uh, Donald Trump once again gives it his blessing and, and lets that be his, his cause. So uh, my party has moved from very pro-trade. We used to pass so many trade deals when I was in Congress there for almost 30 years, and now nobody's talking about trade, and we are the poorer for it because trade, as we know, is beneficial to our domestic economy for jobs, internationally, build better partners, you name it. Trade is good for everyone if it's free and fair trade. So I worry about that 2026 uh, date, Joshua, what, what could happen and uh, what the mood of our country will be and whether we can function as a government. We're very divided, very toxic right now. Thank you very much. I agree with you. Uh, Joshua, all the panelists, hello, and thank you everybody for being here with us uh, today. Um, I will start uh, remembering where we, when we renegotiated NAFTA, it was another kind of world. There was no pandemic, there was no regionalization, it was still globalization, the, the world that we were talking about today, it's regionalization, and the powerhouse in uh, North America is clear. In Europe, you have so many countries that, that can work with or without, even with North Africa, even with Turkey, Turkey. Uh, in Asia, the same. But North America is a compact group of three countries. In this new uh, system, uh, that it's obviously globalization, but with a strong regionalization. And in this sense, we were really happy after the negotiations, not during the negotiations, because it was really stressed. The, the automotive sector was one of the most benefited ones because of the value of uh, regional content value. This means that with the former, with the NAFTA, we had to have in each car 62.5% light vehicle, 60% in heavy vehicles, and now we have to uh, implement 75% of all the parts have to be from the uh, continent, from the, from the North America. In this sense, uh, nearshoring is booming. In this sense, so many investments from Mexicans, from Americans, from Canadians are flowing into Mexico, or Mexicans are also investing in the US. This is happening. In, in this sense, we are uh, moving uh, and having a very interesting success, but there are also the uh, shadow sides like the labor disputes. We have had too many, uh, I say, in the automotive sector. From the top, we have had 10 are from the automotive sector. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, more politically oriented than really uh, with some um, points that we could uh, re reveal uh, in an easy way. And also the other one, the big one, we have to mention this, the only panel that we have had in Mexico that Mexico and Canada won has not been implemented because of, I don't know, rules are rules and if we don't obey and not move in this framework, we will have problems in other areas. Yeah. I'll just add, um, yeah. I'll, I'll stay at a macro and then dip into a micro level. And as uh, probably the, the biggest um, user of USMCA um, as a railroad that includes all of Canada, all of the United States, and all of Mexico, we are really the personification of what USMCA and, and its pre predecessor NAFTA uh, was meant to be, a uh, holistic ecosystem of transportation and f facilitation of trade. Um, heavy haul, in our case, mostly uh, freight and intermodal. That, that will create uh, the stability and um, rule of law, so to speak, on trade uh, to give um, users of heavy haul freight the confidence to invest in any of the three countries, knowing that the fabric of the USMCA trade, whether it's dispute resolution, trade uh, structure, or um, governance, will allow them to safely invest 
and know that at least for the duration of the trade agreement, they have stability in how goods will move from one country through or to another, another of the three trading partners. From a more micro level, uh, in the last three years, I've really invested a lot of time in some of the lesser known articles of the free trade agreement. Um, in USMCA, Article 23 talks about labor and how we can build skills and development and create more value in particularly Mexico to not only compete effectively on a head-to-head -head basis in all three countries from a skills and capabilities perspective, but also to inspire traditional historic um, elements within that labor structure vis-a-vis -vis unions, companies, govern governance, <coughs> and law uh, to move towards something that gives more stability and credibility yeah. from a resource perspective so that we're, when we're competing as a region, we're competing apples to apples uh, in all three countries. Yeah, well, I, I want yeah. to, to add something. No? We need to remember that one of the negotiation axes for the U, of the USMCA was to, to create uh, inclusive, uh, to create a responsible and also a sustainable relation, business relationship. Mexico have, uh, had a special uh, targets in the social responsibility. No? Through the strengthening of all the of all the protection of workers, now we are working so hard during these last years. You know that a government uh, uh, reforms our uh, federal labor law. We, they also have established new Mexican official standards. We are working in some different programs that uh, just have the the objective to improve the quality of our workers, you know, the quality of our uh, worker lives. Uh, we are working so hard. Um, recently, the, the new federal center shared some figures with us. You know, unions, uh, unions are doing their jobs. You know, they, are, uh, um, they are established all the, the new uh, democracy processes where workers need to uh, a vote no, with the direct, direct, uh, free and secret votes. Uh, unions uh, recently they finish the the uh, collective uh, the collective uh, agreements. They finish the leg legitimization of the collective agreements, and also uh, we have some opportunities. We know that uh, the working is has been perfect performing in a way, but we, we have some other objectives to cover during the, the next years. No? But I think that Mexico, in, in that specific part, we had the, the strongest uh, objectives to accomplish, but we are working in a, in a collective effort uh, between uh, the uh, government, the worker union, and also the formal business industries. Yeah, that's that's very helpful, and and I, I think you know, Louise, your point at the beginning that we're only three years in, is a really important one. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in the agreement. There's a lot of business changes that have to happen. There's a lot of learning that's involved. Um, at a macro level, we have the pandemic and, and the war in Ukraine, so it's very hard to sort out what's what at the moment. Um, I just want to pick up on the labour piece a little bit more. It was obviously uh, you know a fundamental sort of one of the big changes from NAFTA. Uh, the Labor chapter became enforceable. There was the rapid response mechanism, which I mentioned yeah. has been used um, significantly. It was, I think, um, a key part of what got Democrats on board mm -hmm. for the agreement in Congress as well. The AFL, CIO, I think for the first time, came out in support of this trade agreement. So at, at various levels, it was very significant. Um, I think it's going to be a significant piece, most likely, in the review period as well, um, as, as different stakeholders and constituents look at how the agreement is going. Um, I'd like to just open it up to whoever wants to kind of engage on how they see that part of the agreement going so far. Is it operating as we thought it would operate? Um, is it effective on the ground? Um, in any, any angle you might want to take on that. Well, well if, if you don't mind, I wouldn't yeah. mind jumping in there because that, uh, I spent the last uh, couple of years uh, dealing with modernization of labor agreements yep. uh, from the view of how do we make a generational shift in supporting our, our workers 
by accelerating skills, getting greater access to promotion, and as a company, having the social responsibility to improve working conditions, to improve salaries, and to really create that, that drive for discretionary effort and skills development. Um, and on its own, dealing face-to-face uh, -face with union leaders in a natural negotiation. And full disclosure, I spent half of my career as a trained driver and a union representative before I went into management. So I've got, got about half of my career on both sides of that equation. I'm very proud of that, by the way. But, but um, I, having, having that first round of discussion and there's no real um, impetus for change in modernization uh, on either side, so it has to be kind of a, 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 you know, a willingness on both sides to address uh, an ongoing opportunity or case for change. But as we got to a point where we needed help, the Center of Conciliation was an incredible resource, is a considerable resource for us in Mexico. Uh, and we've had great success with then uh, Secretary Alcalde and now Bolaños um, in their support for us in moving the conversations along, keeping as much uh, ownership and accountability on the company side as much as the labor side, but trying to really bring the, the, the parties together. And what, I, what I think is really becoming clear is the aspiration that are, that are outlined, uh, aspirations that are outlined in the agreement um, need then more kind of political, public se private, uh, public sector, even law um, teeth to them. And I think as we migrate, you know, meander through these changes and really understand what else, this, the what, so what, now what kind of questions we all have to ask as, we, as this evolves. What do we need to do in the private sector to drive change? How does government need to respond so that both parties are protected, all parties are protected, and that the um, purpose is of the articles, in this case, Article 23, is really um, driven, uh, driving legislative agenda, uh, trade agenda, and even socioeconomic urgency. And, and as you know, uh, as we all know, the, the no votes um, especially in the Senate, uh, where the Democratic no votes uh, were tied to the labor and environmental aspects of, uh, of the agreement, even though um, it was talked about how these were the, the best protections for the environment, the best protection for, uh, for employees, but still the, the resistance to the environment and labor protections were fierce in the legislative arena. And uh, Congress may very well assert its oversight power that is given to them in the, in the agreement in 26 to say, uh, maybe we went, we went too far with the, with the environmental protections or maybe we didn't go far enough, but there will be uh, quite a lot of controversy uh, about the environment and labor protections uh, in, the, in the agreement. Some want them tougher, some want them eliminated, and, uh, and it, it's gonna be a real a real Donnybrook when, when we get to that discussion. But uh, um, I think that it, it will get worked out because we have seen the incredible benefits from of all of the economies. But now with uh, you know the hottest summer ever and a lot of environmental concerns, um, I, th I think that uh, the more liberal members in the Senate and the House will push for stronger provisions and oh my goodness that will that will be so difficult to uh, uh, to pull the rabbit out of the hat once again that uh, they might want to change it but it, it's just going to be too hard you'll have to be sitting there again it's just going yeah, right. <laughs> and going through that uh, that agony and uh, let let's hope that we we can appeal to the better angels of our nature and get a, a well thought out that not everybody's going to get what they want, but it's a good, balanced uh, agreement with with environment and labor protections, and people will live to fight another day on something else. I agree completely. In the environmental arena, we want to enforce it and to enhance it in in every way. As uh, industry, we are ready to use more renewable energies. We need those. Uh, we are ready also to have more water um, um, treatments and so on. And I would like also to emphasize in the labor 
uh, agenda, that we have to equalize it. Why equalize it? As you know, for example, a Mexican company has to uh, legitimacy the, the, the contracts um, uh, before the, the authority, and uh, there is no obligation for the American unions to do this. What happens is that the Mexican company has a very interesting breaks production in Mexico and in the U.S., and the, the, the plant in the U.S. has no union. Then it's very interesting the, the, the things that can happen. For example, you know uh, nowadays there's a huge strike in Detroit. Uh, the UAW, uh, this is the automotive uh, union of uh, the, the union of automotive workers. Uh, they are um, with some demands, 40% uh, salary increase, 33 hours a uh, week, and so on, other things. The issue here is that they are fighting the three picks, Ford, GM, and Stellantis, but there is, for example, no union in Rivian, in Tesla, and there's, there's shifts that we have to be very careful, very careful because if we do impose some strict notions of how to deal with labor, then the Chinese will overflow the whole continent with electric cars, like it's happening in Mexico, in Chile, in Colombia, in Europe. Then we have really to have a, a broader vision and not only to settle more and more disputes on the auto part industry, uh, because we have had no problems. If you can see from the 10th uh, that, that, that they have been installed and, and disputed, everyone has been settled in a magnificent way. Then the idea is really to review, equalize, and, to, and also to consider what's happening in the rest of the world, because we will have problems in the three picks with no need to push, because there are other countries and other new uh, cars that are ready to take a huge stake of the business. And that's another example of the, of the shifting of the Republican Party. President Trump went out there to visit with them, and of course, President Biden as mm -hmm. well. But uh, only, only Ronald Reagan would have, would have done that bef before him, because uh, uh, our, our party traditionally does not go for, uh, for strikes and, and to, to be commiserating with, uh, with striking workers. But uh, it's the populism that's, uh, that's changing. Sorry, I can try. No. Well, I will share that uh, we uh, in Mexico we have been working so hard. We we now have the transparency, more transparency, and uh, uh, in in the case of uh, this relationship between the 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 three the three parties, uh, we also have observers observers here you know, for all the these uh, uh, new democracy uh, and. Uh, and many, many eyes are, are looking mm. our new uh, labor, labor aspects and, and our new labor regulations. And I think that uh, here in Mexico, uh, government and also the formal business uh, sector uh, have invest a lot of money to have this, this in, in, in a sharp, no? in, in a sharp way in this moment. And uh, well, the observers are are being uh, in 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 all these new rules, uh, and and I, I think that we need to to equalize that, as Francisco said. Yeah, and just just not to belabor the point, but whether whether a company decides to or, or workers decide to be represented represented by labor or self self governance yeah. that's that's up to them and and that should always be up to the worker and to the companies to work that out but what i what i think is important and i think is very landmark in in the use of usmc as as a pivotal point is clarity transparency and and democracy and people being able to make those choices those choices being very visible and their the purpose very clear because in the end to leverage USMCA and, and have that article valuable is to create a competitive landscape on productivity uh, in a fair and balanced way that doesn't uh, isn't on the back of any particular participant in that supply chain ecosystem. And uh, I, I, as we said, it's very early days. Uh, I think we're seeing a lot of uh, new um, 
stability, new clarity, uh, and I think that um, that clarity also shows the gaps, and those gaps then have to be addressed in, in a way that uh, personify the values of the USMCA and the intent of the respective articles. But productivity and capability is really the driving force, no matter how a, a worker is represented. Thanks. That's actually really helpful perspective. Um, do you want to come no, on? I'm good on okay. That. Um, I want to turn now briefly to the review mechanism. Um, just for just if, this is probably common knowledge to most people in the room, but the, the original proposal from the Trump administration was that the agreement would expire in six years. Uh, so this was something that I think both Mexico and Canada sort of pushed back on, and this was sort of the compromise outcome that you would have a joint review in six years, and if you didn't get consensus to renew, it would expire in, after 16 years. Uh, it's effectively what we have now. It's a very skeletal um, chapter, so, so there's not a lot there, but there is this notion of joint review in there. So I, I, have a I, I want to approach this from two different perspectives. One, I'd like the panellists to, to address what, if you were to think about what a productive, what a joint review could be of USMCA, what it could look like, um, not, not, not what it will look like, <laughs> But your view of how would we approach this if we were going to approach this as a productive exercise, what would you envisage for a joint review um, process? And then we, we can get into what we think is going to happen. Um, so let me, let me start with you, Louise. Well, what, what Canada wants is, is, is a very smooth rollover. Tick the box. Just tick the box. Uh, why I say that, it's not to say that USMCA is perfect and there couldn't be any improvements here and there. The issue is the context that we're in right now is problematic. As we've heard, there the Congress is split, and you're you're as if it's not what we know for sure. What we don't know is that we believe, although Congress disagrees, but we, the, the, we believe that if the three leaders decides decide together to renew it, it gets renewed. Congress says no, 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 no. We should be able to chime. But so that's something that's a debate in Canada. It's just. The prime minister has the authority to turn it over. So, so, so that's so that we there's uncertainty about. But what we what we really know for sure is that if any changes are made whatsoever, a comma, a period, then then you're really basically unraveling the the sweater. You know, it's just like it's it's just I think going to create a lot of problems because everyone's going to jump in for what they want. Blah, blah, blah. So I think for us, we believe that you just you just tick the box, renew it because of the certainty element of it, the stability element of it that we've heard. And if there are areas in which we believe we want to further cooperation, we can do that on the side. It could be done through other mechanism. I'll just finish by saying one of the mechanisms that's been not well used at all in the agreement to date is the competitiveness committee. And that committee has not been very active. And that's the kind, that, will, that is the window to look at further things that could be done. But it hasn't been all that active. So no, in a word, um, uh, just, just roll it over and, uh, and deal with any uh, quote unquote other issues or ir irritants as a side, uh, as a sidebar. I agree, yeah. and and I hope and pray that that is what will happen because um, Congress is so, the House is so divided, Senate's divided, uh, the White House has not been um, present and accounted for, and any comma would would unravel this, and I I worry that uh, a Congress that can't pass a a Mother's Day resolution would certainly uh, <laughs> would certainly destroy this great this great trade agreement. So I worry I worry about that. Let's check what is it? Check the box or what did you say? Check, yeah. check the box. Check the box. Yes. Don't block the box. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with no um, deep negotiations on the agreement, but yes on the side agreements in labor and environmental. And also, we should address at least, I don't know, this is a huge thing, the migration. This is some, something that's happening, that's, that's causing a huge problem. Nowadays, uh, Abbott is blocking uh, Nuevo Laredo, Laredo Bridge. Not blocking, but reviewing all the, the trucks. And this is a huge cost for both industries. 
and of course to Canada too, because it's a way of Mexico to go to Canada. And I think that we have at least to review things in a different way. But labor and environment, we should review this with another optic. When we signed the agreement, there were no EVs. When we signed the agreement, there was no regionalization. And in that time, uh, also, uh, labor was not a, a huge issue in the US. And nowadays, we need a lot of uh, workers in so many areas. Yeah. And I think at least we have to, to take a special concern about it. Francesco, can, can I jump yeah. in? Will you allow me, yeah. Josh? I, would you agree then that USMCA really should be considered the base, the starting point yes. from which you can build agreed language, as we used to call it at the UN? Sort of, you don't go backwards. You never go backwards. That's you right. go forward. Would you agree? I agree that? completely. Uh, additionally, oh, sorry, um, in, in the labor aspect, I, I think that we need to, to cover another aspect, not just the, the unions and the collective bargainings. Uh, the USMCA established uh, in, 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 uh, in that uh, specific <coughs> chapter uh, the training, no? the, uh, how we can develop the, the workers' skills. And I think that we need to work a lot between the, 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 the members, no? the member countries. I understand that now the ILO is reviewing that, that is a apprenticeship part. And I think that we need to work together because it's a different uh, labor uh, moment. We have uh, in all the countries, we have an important lack of, wo of uh, workforce and we need to invest more, uh, more time to, to review this important point. No? The training, the, and, and obviously it will uh, help us with the, um, a major employability and also uh, the, the improve the incomes of all the workers. No? I think that we need to cover those, that specific part, not, not just the union and the collective and, and, and things that are in, in, in the news all, uh, every day. I need to work in, uh, in the training for the workers. And uh, just from a private sector perspective, uh, I would say that uh, we've just made a $31 billion uh, bet on the viability of trade across North America and um, the use of heavy haul. And, and of course, USMCA, uh, the, the stability of that is important. So from where I sit in the private sector is how did the trade agreement help me facilitate uh, and convert on um, an aspiration of leveraging the, the stability of the USMCA and trade across the three countries to action and to actual value creation for customers, shippers, uh, and people across the, our network. And so I, I, I guess I would have to get a, a fact list to help support how does private sector benefit from public sector uh, stability and and uh, how do we then convert or refine that? So I, I, I've got a checklist. We, we're building a second international bridge between uh, Laredo and Nuevo Laredo. Uh, it's a hundred million dollar investment that comes online at the end of the second uh, end of the 24. We're on top of that working with government across both sides of that border to create a secure corridor. Uh, it's about an 18 mile corridor that um, gives certainty to inspection standards, safety standards, training skills and development, uh, and really helps to um, address the need for speed across the, the corridor, but then has um, s secondary benefits in, in not only the railway safety and railway goods security, but also then extends to how CBP does their job at the border and, and frees up time to address the trucks and helps us convert trucks using that secure corridor, using that uh, uh, second bridge to have a value creation for uh, our environmental um, uh, aspirations and, and greenhouse gas emission uh, limitations and be more competitive. I think it also says then how do we work with inspection and border standards uh, and have a, a similar standard that we have between Canada and the United States and, and have those same standards replicated between the United States and Mexico from a rail perspective. It's almost seamless between Canada and the United States. It's not quite that way uh, between Canada, or US and Mexico for, for our point of view. 
so how does how does the agreement help us in that respect? And and again, how does it help us move the dialogue and move the needle on modernization of labor, so that as we get all of these things working in conjunction, then we have the right resources, the right investments, the right stable uh, regulatory framework to be able to convert and add value to North America because we need to, private sector and public sector alignment and aspirations of nearshoring are just that until they're converted by action by the parties, uh, public and private, to create that stability. And uh, I think that will be, those facts have to be generated, they have to be counted. And you know the score of every hockey game is zero, zero at the start uh, and you count the score between every period and you know, you block shots, time on ice, all of that stuff. Yes, I am Canadian. Uh, <laughs> they all matter. I, I don't say. get those references. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we have to keep score. Well, well, John, let me let me um, just. I mean, you've effectively answered this question, but I just want to make this question more explicit. And this is also to all the panelists. What what would be the consequence of failing to tick the box or renew USMCA in 2026? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you'd have ambiguity. I, I think you would have an ambiguous uh, question and answer to why, why are things happening? Why are, why are good things happening? Why aren't they happening? If we tick the boxes and keep score, then we can align the contributions and the accumulation of value to something that, that really creates a stable platform across three nations to create a regional perspective on trade. Um, and look, I, I'm a railroader, I, I'm not uh, a global economist or international trade specialist, but I do know that uh, making things very transparent, making them simple and making them repeatable is how you create value in transportation. Um, helping people address anomalies like we've, saw, we, we've seen in the last couple of weeks at the border and get to the root cause and, and drive public sector and private sector alignment to resolve those issues is very important. And you could even argue, historically, that was probably left to one agency or another. That's not my job, that's your job. Well, the reality is, if we're gonna compete globally, then it has to be all of our collective responsibilities. There may be you know, specific duties assigned to those responsibilities, but if we don't come together to, to demonstrate that commitment to continuous improvement, productivity, and clarity and transparency across all sectors, then we lose the advantage and the aspiration will just be that. Yeah. Great. And I think that for, for Republicans, they'll have the opportunity uh, to bring up immigration and the chaos of the border. And it will be too much of a temptation for them to not take a bite of that apple. They'll see this if, we, if we're not willing to, to check the box, it'll open up uh, a, ben, a Pandora's box where uh, they'll want to solve all of the issues, corruption in Mexico, and uh, no, don't don't shoot the messenger. I hear, I'm just talking about what goes on in Congress and the rhetoric that is being used, and uh, and they will they will use this as the opportunity to try to solve the the border crisis using UM, uh, USMCA, which is never never the intent, quite the opposite. So, but it's a temptation they they can't resist. Yep. Well, we know what, where that got Adam, right? <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's good. Just, just to, uh, for me, really, um, if if really we fall into that chaos of not renewing the agreement, I think if there's only one silver lining in that is that once it's gone, then people will appreciate it. The thing about USMCA and its predecessor NAFTA is that it works so well that people don't notice. It, it's not front page news, it's not any of that. It just works. And, but the moment you pull the plug, watch out. And then, you know, so you're asking me to speculate, I would say disaster, economic turmoil, problems. Um, I think capital would, would be affected. Um, but then I'm an optimist, after a year of that kind of pain, maybe, everyone would come back to the table. But um, that's my sort of hopeful. Yeah, I, 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 no, I think, I think that I think. resonates. Did anyone else want to come in? Yes, as, as you said, 
check the box, not the Pandora box, check the box. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> really, let's uh, have uh, stability and growth in this way. Uh, because we have seen something in that direction that they didn't check the box and Brexit came into place. Yeah. And this is a huge chaos for yeah. uh, mm -hmm. the, the Britain, for Great Britain. And I think that we should learn from that. But it's so easy if the, we don't check the box to start reviewing the commas and the, the dots and so many small things and we can lose the approach. That's why we can review the side agreements, but not the USMCA. Um, this is a, a little bit turning into what, what now we think is going to happen. I, I, I hear a lot of check the box, but I do, I do want <laughs> to push you on check the box as we, as we go through what we think will happen. Um, because I think, I think one thing that could happen, which would be somewhat consistent with check the box, would be um, to look at the agreement, look at what's working, look at... Um, areas that maybe weren't considered but are now becoming particularly important, whether it's EVs or supply chains, um, artificial intelligence, whatever it may be, and, and to developing a built-in agenda um, that would be pursued maybe through the Competitiveness Committee or elsewhere, but it would not sort of hold up the, the exercise of, of, of ticking the box. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to see if sort of that more fulsome approach is something that you think is consistent with check the box or do we do we risk having that conversation and opening up too much? Um, and let me just use that as a specific question. Um, and if you want to then answer what you think, in fact, is going to happen with you know where we are now, um, that would also be an, an interesting addition, I think. What I would love to see happen is not only that that USMCA gets, gets uh, renewed, reviewed, very good, but that we try to expand it I'm, I, I know I'm wishful thinking here, but uh, what a great instrument to, to foster positive relations with our democratic partners in Latin America. Latin America is is in chaos right now, and uh, and and doing some sort of a USMCA, not as not as uh, fulsome, uh, not as ambitious as that one, but to do it with some of our democratic uh, neighbors in Latin America would would. Uh, bring prosperity, um, maybe is a good way to do away with the immigration crisis somewhat and uh, would be beneficial for, for the U.S. economy. That's, that's a, a, a dreamy-eyed look at it, but uh, that's what I wish in a perfect world would happen. We would take the good things about it and do small trade deals with, with our hemispheric neighbors. That would please me very much. Yep. <laughs> I, for me, I think that uh, I'd love for us to be ambitious like that. I completely agree, and I think we're all in agreement with this. And um, what I, what I, my observation is, I mean, having lived in the U.S. for so long, being in Canada, being in Mexico all the time, in Canada, certainly I can say Canadians would be open to um, to improving or making, bringing further things to the table. But we're very, right now, we're in talks with our government back home, and we're talking about what's the best strategy leading to 2026. And so far, the strategy has been to kind of lay low, lay low. Don't make waves, don't. And you know, that's where the compliance come in, comes in. We're lobbying our government to tell them they're contemplating a digital tax that some argue could be in contravention to our uh, commitments to the USMCA. We're going, don't, 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 because it don't draw the eye of Sauron. I mean, you just don't <laughs> don't rock the boat. This is not the yeah. time before the election. Don't give ammunition. But then I'll just close by saying that doesn't mean that we can't lay the groundwork by relationships, speaking to Congress, having these conversations with elected officials or those who might be elected or those who speak to who will be elected as well as doing what Enrique was saying yesterday, building the, uh, a, a, a stronger foundation for this idea that North America is good for all of us and, and trying to prevent uh, the misinformation, uh, misinformation that we're living with right now, the fact that uh, many Americans vote against their best interests. Sorry, mm -hmm. we have this Consul General of the United States here uh, in Monterey. I should be careful with what I say. <laughs> I'm sorry, Roger. <laughs> But, um, you know, 
getting facts out, making sure we, we create the basis so that maybe one day we can be more ambitious. Um, on this okay. basis, yeah. uh, laying the basis, we just uh, were in Washington with the National Association of Manufacturers, and from the private sector, the idea is to start to enjoy the NAFTA, the, the USMCA, sorry, uh, not only uh, using it behind the, the, the screen, we want to show that we are, as manufacturers, really working with the USMCA with the governments and that it's good for everybody. Yeah, and I, I spent time in the mid 2000s in, I was uh, responsible for Vancouver and trade uh, in Canada's West Coast. And I was, uh, I, I really benefited from the Canadian government strategies on Asia Pacific gateways and the investment, both physical investment and uh, regulatory investment in supporting that trade as a, as a Someone who's worked in Canada for 30 years in the transportation business, moved to the United States for the last 10, and now spends most of my time in Mexico. I, I, I think the Canadian perspective, especially the Canadian government perspective, is still um, an academic exercise on, on the value of trade between Canada and Mexico. The security concerns certainly are. Uh, and uh, really coming, coming to work in this trinational company, it, it, it really is uh, the personification of all the things we aspire to, but all of the things that we need to do as well. And aligning the regulatory um, support, the public uh, sector investment in skills and regulatory landscape, legal landscapes that will help facilitate trades and really bring that, that light to the trilateral or the tri-country trade valuation is important. I think the difference in NAFTA is that NAFTA was kind of um, let's let's improve something, let's create something. Uh, USMCA probably was a continuation of that, and then we had COVID, and now we've got an impetus for change at a pace and scale that we've never seen, with an urgency that that is known by participants in the ecosystem. And you know, we there was probably wasn't a dinner conversation that didn't include supply chain over the last uh, 24 months in any home anywhere in the world, let alone in North America. But now we've got this trade agreement that can really be used to accelerate the pace of change. And what I think government has to do, they have to keep up with the business pace of change because government business will always change faster to respond to competitive landscape, emerging opportunities, or whatever, whatever the case. And we have to be recognized uh, responsibly with our interaction with government and leveraging trade agreements like USMCA to help shape a faster regulatory landscape that allows competition, allows uh, uh, confidence in investment from a private sector, and allows us to really then take advantage of the hard work that's gone on well before this agreement, but manifested in this agreement. Uh, and that will help demonstrate the value and the reason to re-up to re uh, in even uh, more robustly through side deals, direct deals, whatever the case, uh, and help us really compete with what the, what the threat is. The threat is not having what we have today and not having it at the price point that we have today. And, and I see USMCA as, as being the impetus for value creation, job creation, and North American stability. Thanks, John. Um, we're coming up to time, uh, and I'm going to put the panel on, on the spot and, and, and insist that in, in 30 seconds or less, they identify one thing they would like to see happen between now and USMCA renewal that they think will put us in a better position to tick the box. Compliance to the panel decisions. Compliance, great. Um, I think that it's still working in the... In the uh, quality of life of workers. Okay. Better conflict resolution ideas and um, getting rid of the protectionist provisions in there for Mexico. I say get rid of populism, protectionism, <laughs> and open really the possibility of having these equalized new terms. 
I, I think the creation of a speaking up culture that helps us memorialize the value, the challenges, and the what's next of USMCA so that we can articulate that across three countries, three cultures, and three scopes of business. Great. That's fantastic. Um, we've got our marching orders. I want to thank the panel very much for thank a very you, productive Jeff. and insightful conversation. Thanks to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.